My wife uh, won't come out and say this, but there is one good thing that's going to come out of this, um, and that is she will get to see me in a suit again. <laughs> because, again, I have to wear a suit. I have yet to wear a suit on Sunday morning. Um, I don't think I have worn one for Easter. Um, uh, you know, I think we should, we should strive to look our best on, uh, on when we go to worship God. But um, <clears throat> shouldn't all of our lives be worshipped to God? So shouldn't we look our best all the time? Um, yeah. What motivates us to do things? That's really the, the, uh, the question I want to look at today. We went to dinner uh, on Friday, Danette and I. We typically go out to dinner on Fridays. Uh, Eli goes with us. Sometimes we find a babysitter and we just have a, a her and I time. But Eli went with us and, and we keep forgetting um, that the Elm Street Grill is open on Friday nights. You know, let's be honest. When it comes to places to eat in Shenandoah, Excuse my language for this, but Shenandoah sucks. I know. I know. I, 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 mm, the sanctuary is good, and I love going to the sanctuary. But I'm going to be honest with you. I can't go to the sanctuary every Friday night um, because I, I like getting the same thing every time I go to a place. And listen, after a while, it just... It's pretty bad when you live in a town and, and you've been to all the other restaurants so many times that you're excited about going to McDonald's. <laughs> McDonald's is not a place you go to. It's a place you end up. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Unless you have a five-year-old who loves their pancakes, then it's a place you go. <laughs> so we go to Elm Street. We go to the Elm Street Grill and, and we're sitting down and... We're eating, and it's really, I mean, it's, it started getting crowded. We got there at about 5.15. By 5.30, 5.45, the place was starting to fill up. And so we're enjoying our meal. We order and, and enjoying our meal. And then it's getting time that we're finishing up. A, we ask for a to-go box. She brings us a to-go box. And, of course, Eli, I want one. No, Eli, we'll put your stuff with ours. And so we're, I'm expecting her to bring the check. And she goes, the first thing she says when she walks up the table is, you're all set. I said, no, I'm not. I'm still waiting for the, I didn't say that. That's not going through my mind. I'm thinking, what's she saying? You're all set. I'm not. And then she proceeds to tell us that somebody had paid for our meal. You know what I did? I tried to try to figure out who that was. It, this is not the first time that I've had, um, since we've been living here, that, that we've had people pay for our meals. And sometimes it's pretty obvious. We went to, um, we went to the Mexican restaurant one Sunday after church, and um, we saw some people there we knew. Uh, and when the check came, somebody, they, the, the server said, hey, somebody has already paid for your check. And it wasn't hard for me to figure out who that might have been. But this time it was different. Because while I did see people there, a couple of people there that I, had, that I knew, and that I was pretty sure knew me, I didn't really know for sure if they were the ones, one of the, one of the, the persons that I saw, I was pretty confident did not pay for my meal. Not because they didn't like me. I, I mean, I, 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 talk to, I would talk to them. Every time I see this person, I talk to them. But it was just the, our relationship is not in the sense that he would just spontaneously pay for my meal. He could have. There was another person who I thought, well, maybe this, this person paid for our meal. You know, it, and it, it, I racked my brain probably for the next four hours <laughs> trying to figure out who in the world paid for my meal? Who else would have done that? Be honest. Be honest. You would have done that. I wanted to say thank you. I wanted to, I wanted to show appreciation. Or, and more likely, 
I just don't like not knowing. <laughs> and you know, sometimes you have those moments where God just kind of says, Steve, I want you to learn an important lesson. And, and, and when, he, when God says that to you, 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 you kind of listen. You kind of get your ear out and you get ready to listen. And he takes his big fat hammer and slaps you across the face and says, stop being stupid. I, want, I wanted to know um, who it was. And what God was telling me is that you don't need to know. You don't need to know. You need to just receive the blessing that I want to give you through this person and be content with that. Sometimes we, we don't want to be content. Sometimes we, we want to know. Sometimes we want to even do something about it when God's saying, I don't want you to do anything about it. I want you just to be content. Sometimes we have a problem with just resting. God says that he's going to give us rest. Sometimes we don't want rest. If you're, if you're, if you're like me, even when you are resting, your brain doesn't stop. It just keeps, if you don't believe me, my wife will be able to tell you multiple times where we are sitting there, maybe we're watching TV, or maybe we're just sitting there reading, and then I will blurt out something. Because I've already had a conversation with myself about this topic for about 30 minutes. And then I just blurt something out to my wife, and she looks at me like, he's doing it again. Where did that come from? And then I have to do the whole backstory and everything else. Um, <clears throat> but we don't want to. We don't want to just rest. We don't want to just do. We just want. To, we want. And what God is saying is, you have to get to a point. And this is what He was. He was showing me. I have to get to a point where I worry about the things that truly matter, and not worry about the things that don't really matter. Going up to the district uh, council and, and walking in and, and allowing them to, to pray for me and anoint me with oil and recognize me. In the reality of life, how important is that as far as me complaining about having to go? Not very important. I need to just shut my mouth and go do it because that's not that important. It occupied hours of my mental thought to think about what is a good reason why I shouldn't do that. And it was a waste of two hours. I need to just realize that some things don't need to occupy my mind. Same thing with this. The, who, who paid for our dinner. This, you know, really, the, the four hours or so, and it wasn't four straight hours. It wasn't like for four straight hours I was thinking, who paid for my lunch? Who paid for my lunch? Who paid for my lunch? No, it was, I would think about it for a little while, go through the process of who I saw there and how might that person have paid and who they talked to and this and that and the other. It probably would have been better use of my thoughts than trying to figure out who paid for my, my dinner. And we do this in a lot of ways. We, we waste uh, physical exertion or physical uh, work on trying to work on things that really don't matter. Sometimes we do it with our mental. We, we process and think about things. And in reality, does, is, is it really that important? I want to talk to you about something today that I think we should probably spend more time thinking about and doing um, than we probably currently do right now. And it's really a, a, a change in the way we view things. Now, as you, get, as you grow and you get older, um, 
you, you change the way you view life. Um, when I was five years old, um, I did not know what a, what a chrysalis was. Does anybody know what a chrysalis is? My five-year-old knows what one is, and he had to educate me on what it was. That's how, how smart I feel right now. In case you didn't know, it has to do with a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. The whole little cocoon thing and then boom and all that wonderful thing. Um, I don't view, uh, Eli is much smarter at five years old than I was. Okay. Uh, he took after his mom in that sense. But uh, when I was five years old, I did not view life the same way as I do now. You know what Eli does not worry about? Eli does not worry about whether he's going to have food to eat tomorrow. Eli doesn't worry about making sure that the mortgage gets paid on, on, on the house so that they have a place, he has a place to live. He's not worried about whether he's going to have clothes to wear. He should be because he keeps crawling on his hands and knees and ripping holes in his pants. No matter how often we say, don't, don't crawl on the ground. Needless to say, he has holes in his pants. He doesn't worry about those things. Why? Because he's never had to in the past. Because he has people who take care of him. He doesn't realize that he doesn't have to worry about those things because he's never had to worry about those things. When I was a youth pastor, there was a couple, uh, two kids in the youth ministry, and um, they, were, uh, they were neglected. And one of them was older, and one of them, uh, it was a, the boy was older, and the girl was a little younger. And there were times in their life where they had to, to scrounge for food. Where they had to hoard food to make sure they had food enough to last them when they got hungry. And the only, the only reason I even found out about it, this was before I knew them when they were really young. Um, I found out about it because I was talking with their grandma once. And when they started living with their grandma, their grandmother noticed that bags of food would be missing from the, from the cabinet. And she was like, well, where is all, where's this food going? Come to find out, the boy who was older was taking food out of the cabinets, in, putting them in his room and hiding them to, 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 ha to make sure that he had food for him and his sister if, if something were to happen. He was, he, he was basing his reality on what has happened, not on the new reality in which he was living. He was going to have plenty of food with his grandmother. But he was still basing his reality based on what has happened. And if we're not careful, we allow that same type of thinking to seep into our relationship with God. We start believing things, or we, we, we stop believing falsehoods that we used to believe, even though we know we shouldn't believe them anymore. I see it, I see it all the time. I see it all the time. Nobody, nobody would argue within the sound of my voice, whether you're watching on TV or in this room, nobody would argue that each person in this room or, or watching on... Would, you know that you are so valuable to God that he would be willing to give up his life. Nobody would argue that. And yet there are people struggling with identity of who they are. People who have been Christians for a long time. And why? Why do, why do people struggle like that? It's because, it's because they are... They are living and, and, and not being able to, to truly understand the transformation that happens from pre-Christ to their new life in Christ. If we truly understood exactly how God views us and how God loves us and how he is willing to die for us, the God who created the universe 
cares about each one of you so much that he allowed part of himself to die. And yet, sometimes we feel inadequate, we feel unworthy, we feel like there's no hope, there's, th that we have no purpose. And it's because we're not allowing, we're allowing what we used to believe about ourselves before we were introduced to God, we allow that to carry over into our new life in Christ. And it's a struggle. I get it. It's a struggle. I've said this before. I've, I've never really dealt, and personally, I've never really dealt with my self-worth self or my self-value or my purpose. Part of that is because I had parents who loved me, and I had parents who loved God, and they instilled a value in me of who I am. Now, there's a danger. There was a point in time uh, in, in my younger years, and even now when I'm on the golf course, where I think I'm better than I am. Just like, be honest with you. But when we allow, when we allow our, our pre-Christ or our secular ideas about who we are, when we allow them to to move over into our new life in Christ, it creates problems. So how do we accurately understand? How do we accurately um, live out who God has called us to be? Without, without getting proud, without, with remaining humble, Well, there's this 10-step program that you can buy online, and it will solve all of your problems. If you believe that, there's this oceanfront property in Arizona that I'm selling. I can, I'll just talk to me after service, and I'll sell it to you. There is just no, there is no 10-step program. If there was a 10-step program that we could do, that we could follow to just automatically have this, this great life in Christ, if that was the case, we wouldn't need the Bible. In fact, we wouldn't need anybody except for those 10 steps in our life. There's a reason why Jesus didn't say, okay, if you do these five things, then your life will be godly and you'll never have to worry about anything ever again. Reason, part of the reason why he did that is because, first of all, that is, uh, is works-based. And that means that we could somehow accomplish something on our own without God. And that's just not the case. So what is it? What, what do we do? How do we act? How do we get this idea of, uh, of living who God wants us to be? And, and maintain that type of. I, I've had some pastors who have, <clears throat> who have preached that um, it is impossible to be perfect. We are following, we had, we are following creatures, I get that. Um, and I'm going to be honest with you, I think it is nearly impossible, nearly impossible to, to start now and live a perfect life. But I do, not, I do not believe God would call us to perfection if it was not attainable. That being said, that being said, once you think that you can attain it, You've already failed because you allow pride to creep in. Oh, I can do that. When I was in, when I was in high school, um, there was a pastor, the pastor of our church. He actually said, and I don't remember if it was from the pulpit or in a conversation I heard him say. He actually said, I can go a whole day without sinning. Yeah, 
Isaac, you just sinned. Not because, and, and maybe, I, maybe I'm missing it, but, but that seems awful prideful. Maybe he didn't mean it pridefully. And maybe, maybe he's just super spiritual and he could go a whole day without sinning. But I know me. And let me tell you, usually by the time, by the time I get done eating breakfast, I've already thought, said, or done something that I shouldn't have. And I eat breakfast pretty early. So how do we, how do we live this life that God wants us to live? Understand who we are in Christ and live that way. How do we do all that without finding ourselves in a prideful situation? View ourselves the way God wants us to be viewed. View ourselves as valuable. I think Amos <coughs> gives us um, an illustration, a good one too, of how we can start down the road to being who God wants us to be, or maybe continuing down the road of being who God wants us to be. As I said before, it's not a 10-step program. I wish it was. If it was, it would be a whole lot easier. But we're going to read Amos um, out, out of chapter 5. Before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about the person Amos. Amos, is uh, he was a prophet. Um, his book was a collection of sermons, and there was some poetry lived in there, and then some visions toward the end. Um, <clears throat> he, he, he spoke during the, um, the reign of Jeroboam II, and this is important to know when he was uh, speaking or, or sharing as a prophet, because it speaks directly to the situation in which the nation of Israel was um, facing. By the time Amos came around, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom have, uh, had already split. I think it was about 150 years after they had split. So you have the kingdom of Israel is the northern kingdom. The kingdom of Judah is the southern kingdom. Um, Amos was a shepherd in the southern kingdom. And God called him and told him, I want you to go to the northern kingdom. And I want you to, to share with them my judgment. Now, if you know anything about Israel, uh, Israelite history, you know the southern kingdom was a little bit more spiritual. Not by a lot, but a little bit more spiritual than the northern kingdom. Um, you know, their, their, their situation was different. Even their cultures, believe it or not, was different because of the, how they worshipped. Remember, southern Judah, the, the, the southern kingdom of Judah had Jerusalem, and in Jerusalem you had the temple. The temple was where the Israelites would go to worship. Well, the northern kingdom weren't going to go down to the southern kingdom to worship in the temple, so they had to get their own temple. And actually there were two of them, one in Gilgal and one in Bethel. And, and that's where they would worship. But something else that happened, Jeroboam actually not only built these temples, but actually put... A golden calf in both of these temples. If you re remember your history, the golden calf first was introduced when the Israelites were waiting on Mount Sinai for God to reveal his, his commandments, to, to reveal his law. And because Moses was gone so long, Aaron decided, you know what? Hey, let's, let's give me all of your gold and let's, let's put it in the fire and see what happens. And as he relates it to Moses... He threw all the gold in the fire, and what happened? Out jumped the golden calf. I was burning, I was, I was burning, I, I don't think I should have, but I was, I was burning some wood yesterday in my backyard. I have a big barrel um, that I was burning it in, but I was burning it. And as I was, I was <coughs> burning, I did something really stupid. I seem to say that too much. I had a piece of plywood, and I did not even think about it. I had a piece of plywood, and I leaned it up against, and then there's a 55-gallon barrel, and I leaned it up against the barrel, and I'm burning wood inside the barrel. <laughs> Big fire. <laughs> and 
And I, I leave. I mean, it's in the barrel. I'm thinking, no problem. I go and I do a couple of things. I come, I come back, and that piece of plywood that was leaning up against the barrel is on fire. <laughs> you know what my first thought was? Reach down there and grab that piece of wood with my hand. Just don't. I finally got it all broken up, and I put it in the barrel in it, in it, but... But to think, you have this fire burning, and you can put something in there, and then it jumps out as a golden calf. First of all, I don't see how a golden calf could actually jump, but, but even worse than that, how it could form itself. You know what I think? I think that, um, I think the people who be- believe in evolution as a feasible way that, that the world started, they're going along the same lines that Aaron did. Oh, we just took all this gold, we threw it in there, and pff, ah, hey, out comes this, jump this golden calf. Of course, Aaron didn't stop there. Then he started blaming the people. It, it, first of all, he blames Aaron, he blames Moses. If you hadn't been up on that mountain for so long, we wouldn't have had this problem. And then he started blaming the people. If it was, these people, it's these people's fault. We're good at finding excuses. We are really good at finding excuses. So Jeroboam, the first, Jeroboam the first, had these, these temples built, had the golden calves in there, and that was part of their worship. Now, now remember, these temples were built to, to Yahweh, just like the temple in Jerusalem was built for, Yah, for the worship of Yahweh. These temples were built for the worship of Yahweh, but the northern kingdom allowed worshiping of other gods to be part of their worship of Yahweh. And that is the, the, the setting that we see as far as worship is concerned, we, we see in the northern kingdom. And that is really what call, what, why God called Amos to go to the northern kingdom. You can almost say that Amos was the first missionary. Going, he was leaving his home, going to kind of a foreign land, even though they were all Israelites, going to a foreign land um, to specifically tell these people about God's judgment. And, and I, you know what, I don't think I would want to be a prophet. Because every time we see God calling a prophet, you know what he had to do? He had to go tell people who were more powerful than him, who were enjoying life, he had to go tell them that they were wrong. I don't like telling somebody wrong when, when it's easy to do. I don't like telling somebody they're wrong. Except for Eli. I like to tell Eli he's wrong sometimes. But most people, part of it is because I'm a people pleaser and I want people to be happy with me. And so telling them wrong makes them not happy with me. And there's that. But especially people who have the power to do me harm. I, you, you don't, I don't want to do that. And yet the prophets, that's what exactly what God was calling him to do. And with Amos, he was telling him, leave your home. You're a shepherd. We find that in the, in the first chapter, first couple of verses. You, he, he was a shepherd, and he was called to go. He was also a, a fig farmer, by the way. To go and leave his home and go. And actually, um, he was only gone for about two years. So all of his messages and everything was w- took took a, a, probably a span of about two years. And he had a lot of harsh things to say, but most of it, almost all of it, can be summed up in, in just a few verses of Amos chapter 5. And that's what I want to read real quick. And then we're going to talk, we're going to talk about how this relates to us living the life that God wants us to live. Now this, verse um, 4 of chapter 5, Now this is what the Lord says to the family of Israel. Come back to me and live. 
don't worship at the pagan altars at Bethel. Don't go to the shrines of Gilgal or Beersheba. For the people of Gilgal will be dragged off into exile, and the people of Bethel will be reduced to nothing. I'm going to stop there for a minute. Sometimes we miss things in our English translations of the Bible. So I want to highlight something real good, r- real quick. And, and that is these two. For the people of Gilgal will be dragged off into exile, and the people of Bethel will be reduced to nothing. <coughs> Gilgal, um, uh, Gilgal is it kind of... Um, has the, the idea of rolling. And so when it, he, when it says, if you, if you understand the Hebrew, when it says, Gilgal will be dragged off into exile, the idea is the one who rolls will roll into exile. Kind of a play on words. And then he says, uh, and the people of Beth-El will be reduced to nothing. Beth-El is two words, Beth and El. Beth meaning house, El meaning God, Bethel, house of God. And the people who, who lived close to Bethel know that there's another town called um, uh, Beth, oh, I had it in here somewhere, Beth Avon. Beth El means house of God, Beth Avon means house of nothing. And so what he was saying was, though you live in the house of Beth El, you're really living in the house of nothing. So, so you, you live in the house of nothing that's going to become nothing. It's a play on, a play on words, play on an idea. While you feel comfortable where you're at, it's not going to last. While you have confidence in what you have, it's actually, it doesn't mean anything, it's nothing. Verse 6, come back to the Lord and live. That's twice he says, come back to me or come back and live. Otherwise, he will roar through Israel like a fire. This is God roaring through Israel like a fire, devouring you completely. Your gods of Bethel won't be able to quench the flames. You twist judgment, I mean justice, making it a bitter pill for the oppressed. You treat the righteous like dirt. It is the Lord who created the stars and the uh, playsides and Orion and turns darkness into morning and day into night. He draws water from the oceans and pours it down on rain and the land. The Lord is his name. With binding speed and power, he destroys the strong, crushing all of their defenses. How you hate honest judges, how you despise people who tell the truth. You trample the poor, stealing their grain through taxes and unfair rent. Therefore, though you build beautiful stone houses, you will never live in them. Though you plant lush vineyards, you will never drink wine from them. For I know the vast number of your sins and the depth of your rebellions. The oppress, uh, you oppress good people by taking bribes and deprive the poor of justice in the courts. So those who are smart... Keep their mouths shut. So all this bad stuff is happening. To be smart, you need to keep your mouth shut. I think James talked about that too. But For it is an evil time. Do what is good and run from evil so that you may live. Then the Lord God of heaven's army will be your helper just as you have claimed. Hate evil and love what is good. Turn your courts into true halls of justice. Perhaps even yet the Lord God of heaven's armies will have mercy on the remnant of his people. So we see a lot happening in this passage, but it all comes back with why they were being judged. They were being judged because of two particular things that that they were doing. One is that they were worshiping, but not, not just that they were worshiping, but that they were worshiping false gods. And it's not just that they were worshiping false gods, although that is bad enough. What they were doing is they were worshiping Yahweh in a false manner while still worshiping false gods. It all all begins and ends with worship. Because they were worshiping God in a false manner and worshiping false gods, 
what happened was their moral deterioration of their society. Because of their unwillingness to worship God the way he has stated, they, under, they knew, they knew the, the, God's law. They knew what God expected of them. The, the Ten Commandments were probably, um, probably somewhere in their minds, knowing that they were not to have any other God within Yahweh's presence, and that they were to worship God the way he has stated. And yet they are failing on those two, two specific things. And as a result, everything else in their lives deteriorated. The rich got richer by oppressing the poor, and the poor got poorer. And he deals with that specifically. He talks about that. But all of that was because of their inability or their, their lack of desire to worship God the way he chose to be worshipped. It's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence that the further away our country gets from the statutes of God, the worse it gets. It's not a mistake. There was a time where you could not go into a courthouse without seeing the Ten Commandments on the law. Now, in most places, it's against the law to have the Ten Commandments in the courthouse. Now, I don't want to get into this whole separated church and state and how all that plays out and the bad and the good of all that stuff. But to say this, when we stop, when we stop working on obeying God's commands, we start working on obeying Satan's. And that's where the Israelites were at. The northern kingdom was at. They, they stopped worshiping God the way they were supposed to and started worshiping God the way they felt good at doing. And as much as I, as much as I like to condemn the Israelites, their stupidity, I can't help but realize that we are doing the same thing. We are worshiping God on our terms. Sure, God, I'm going to come to church and I'm going to raise my hand and I'm going to sing praises to you. But, but when it comes to, to, to making right decisions at work, you know, I've got to make money. And if it's okay, it's okay if I just, this little indiscretion. It's really not going to hurt anybody. Nobody's even going to know. And maybe it's in a relationship. Oh, it, you know, it's okay. This, it, I know this is not exactly how God designed it, but it's, it, it'll be okay. You know, God, I know, I know what you said um, about being generous, but, but I'm the one who need, people need to be generous to because I'm, I'm really in a bad situation, and I, I need people to be generous to me. We... There was a time um, before I met Jeanette and since we got married, there were times in our lives where um, we, were, we were probably living below the poverty level. It wasn't for very long. And, and, and it wasn't that we didn't have food or a place to live, but it took every bit of money we had to survive. And it's easy, it was easy for me to get into the idea that because of our desperate situation, that we no longer had to be generous with our finances. We no longer had to help people 
if, if they needed help. It didn't, when God tells you to be generous, the person's situation in which he tells you to be generous has nothing to do with your responsibility. That person could be a millionaire, but if God tells you to give that person something, it is your responsibility to do it. Not to justify your need. You think that if you're serving God, and that person is a millionaire, that they have more money than you? Then obviously you don't understand who God is. Part of the problem that the Israelites had that we run into is that we forget what true worship is. And true worship is not just coming here on Sunday morning and, and, and raising our hands in worship and telling Jesus how wonderful you are and then sitting down and listening to a good speaker or not so good speaker, depending on if your church or not. And every once in a while saying, amen. That's part of worship. But that is not true worship. You want me to give you a good definition of true worship? True worship is loving obedience. Now listen. Listen carefully. Because this is a very profound statement. Obedience without love is just rituals, and love without obedience is meaningless. True worship has to do with loving obedience. Obedience without love, you're just going through the motions. It's just a ritual that you're doing. It doesn't mean anything. You're doing it. Be, and most of the time, you're doing it because you expect something in return from it. If, if the only reason you come to church is because you want God to bless you, you're doing it out of being, it's just a ritual for you. There's, there's no love in it. If the only reason you're serving God, if the only reason you're serving God is because you don't want to end up in hell, you're probably going to end up in hell. I had a pastor who asked this question. It was very thought-provoking, and I really had to process it. He says, if heaven was not a reward for, 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 for your faithfulness to God, would you still serve God? I'm going to go with my first response to that. It's an ir irrelevant question because heaven is real. But it, it makes you think. It makes you process your actions and what are your actions about. If your actions are only to produce a certain outcome, they're just ritual. There's no love based in there. But on the flip side, if we, just, if we just have love but no obedience, I, I, I mentioned every once in a while, every once in a while, Eli will... Eli will um, come up to me, and um, I'm sure he probably does it to Jeanette, and if he doesn't, I'm sorry, babe. Every once in a while, he'll come up to me, and he'll just look at me, and he says, Daddy, I love you. You know, there, there is nothing, nothing that you can give me. I don't care how much money it is. Okay, maybe, no. I don't care how much money it is. There's nothing you can give me that is going to replace that. And he, he, he didn't come and do that because he, he knows that if he says that to me, he's five years old. Maybe he has a processing power to, uh, to do this, but I don't, don't think he's quite there yet. He didn't come and do that 
because he, he wants me to take care of his, his food or take care of a place to live. He did it be, just out of pure love because of the things that I've already done. It's not based in what I'm going to do. It's what I've already done. And that's where our love should be. Not because of something great that God is going to do in the future. He is going to do great things in the future. But that doesn't mean everything we face in the future is going to be great. He wants us, he wants us to have this, this, this love for him. Because we already know what he's done for us. And if, if our love is based on what he's going to do, it's not really love. So, true worship is this loving obedience. How do we get this loving obedience to be a core of who we are? How do we, how do we make that something that, that just flows out of us naturally. Well, there's this 10-step program that I have that I think you guys can help. The first and, and most important thing that you need to understand, and it ties in with what I said earlier about oftentimes we fail to understand who we are in Christ. And most of the time when we fail to understand who we are in Christ, it's because we fail to understand who God is. In our passage, Amos addresses this in verse 9 and 10. Uh, Amos 5, verse 8. It is the Lord who created the stars, the seven stars, and Orion. He turns darkness into morning and day into night. He draws up water from the oceans and pours it down on the rain and the land. The Lord is his name. With binding speed and power, he destroys the strong, crushing all of their enemies. He is, he is giving... The people he's talking to, a glimpse of who God is. The very first thing he says, the Lord who created the stars. Have you ever tried to um, find your way at night without a compass, without a map? What do you have to use? You have to use the stars, right? As a shepherd, remember I told you he was a shepherd? As a shepherd, he would understand the need for the stars. We, as human beings, are not just reliant on God himself. We are also reliant on what God has made. God made water. Is there anybody in this room that could go a month without drinking any water? Well, Jesus, I mean, he went pretty, pretty long without food, so. But again, he was God. So I don't know. We, are, we are reliant not just on God himself, but we are reliant on the things that he made. He was giving the Israelites an idea about who he was. We are dependent on God. And once we think we are not, we slip into the same thing the Israelites slipped into. Is that is we, we start forgetting about true worship and start worshiping on our own terms. And usually, worshiping on our own terms was about, is about what pleases us, not what pleases God. Listen, when, when they were involved in false worship, the, the two, two of the major ones was Baal. We talked a little bit about him a couple of weeks ago. Um, the other one was Asherah. She was sex goddess. They had prostitutes at the temples, and people would go and, and have sex with prostitutes 
as a way of worshiping. It was a way of pleasing themselves. When we, when we divert from true worship, it manifests itself in all kinds of things. Some of them big, we, we, look, at, we look at prostitution out, outside of the temple of God as, oh, this is terrible, this is terrible, this is terrible. Do you think it's any worse than hating your neighbor? Jesus says himself in chapter 5 of Matthew. You heard that it is said, you shall not kill. But I tell you, even if you hate your brother, We like, to, we, we like to, to judge and classify and, and say, oh, I'm, I would never do that. I would never do that. And yet, it all, it, it all comes back around to having a proper understanding and view of God. You cannot get everything that Jesus and, and, and Yahweh in the Old Testament, everything that they did revolved around the understanding of who God was. The laws in the Old Testament, specifically the, 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 the cleansing laws of the Old Testament, you know what those laws were there for? It's so that the people when they went before God, were cleansed. Because if you went before God and you were not cleansed, it didn't end well for you. In fact, you weren't even, you weren't even able to go into the temple if you, if you had this uncleanliness to you. It was all about the reality of who God is. And we miss that. A lot of times we, we miss that specifically today in our society because we don't have to we don't necessarily have to take a bath before we come to church. I hope you all do, but we don't have to comb our hair. I mean, you do have to wear clothes, but there's no specific set of clothes that you have to wear. And so we get this idea that, well, somehow, somehow God must, must fit into our understanding because we have this freedom about us. You will, you will never be able to worship God perfectly until you understand perfectly who God is. Unfortunately, we will not know perfectly who God is while we live here on this earth. So the best we can do is worship God to the best of our ability. But the only way we can do that is to understand who God is to the best of our ability. Unfortunately, common theme here, we want to do it on our standards and not God's. I'm going to have the worship team come up. They're going to lead us in a song. <clears throat> and while I know I just got done saying that, that just what you do here does not constitute true worship, if it's not lived out in your life, this is a good place to start. This is a good place to begin. We're going to sing a song, and I want you just to, to vocalize with your mouth, how wonderful God is. How great God is. Because, again, God could care less about your actions if your heart is far from him. And that's what the Israelites were dealing with. Their actions were far from God, too. But it was because their hearts were far from God. We need to 
get back into our understanding that God is greater than we are. In fact, if it wasn't for God, you would not have existed. And yet we think, oh, well, you know what? God needs me. How many, but I've said that. God needs me. Yeah, like, who am I? Come on. God wants you, and he will use you if you let him. But to think that God needs me? For what? I can't even make my wife happy all the time. What makes you think God needs me? Let's, let's, let's spend a couple, of, a couple of moments. And all I want you to do while we're singing this, forget about what you have to do later on in the day. Forget about things that happened to you this week. This time, right now, for the next couple of minutes, all I want you to do is give God praise. Worship him. And, and this, isn't, this, isn't, this is the beginning of true worship. It's not the end of true worship. Once you leave here, you have to do the same thing you started doing here. But it starts with the right heart and understanding who God is. Stand with me. accomplish the goal that you've set to minister to people let our worship our true worship our loving obedience let this be the beginning of something great in our lives something more that you have for us Let it not just be a point in time, but for all time. We love you. We worship you. Amen. Amen. I love you guys. Thanks for joining us. Be here on Wednesday if you're interested. We're going to be talking about Amos a little bit more. And uh, just go out. And live out true worship. Be blessed. I love you guys.